I think we can all agree that in today's world, our personal brand is everything. It's how we're viewed. And sadly, perception is reality and it defines our value in today's marketplace. How you go out and share your story to market and promote yourself is really valuable to your success in life. It helps to create that personal brand. Our guest today has over 20 years of experience in helping individuals in professional sports and music envision, define, and share the story of their brand with the marketplace. And those brands built on authenticity are typically the ones who find the most success. She's worked with some of the highest performing powerhouse professional athletes and companies in the brand strategy and sports marketing space. This episode is definitely one you want to tune in for. So welcome to At The Podium. Hello again, and welcome to At The Podium with Manuela Mesqua. I'm a financial advocate, CEO, father, husband, and massive sports fan. I'm obsessed with encouraging people to dream and attack the unique visions they have for their life. And by doing so, I think there's lessons that can help inspire others to do the same. We built the podcast specifically to share the stories of some of the highest performers in my life with the hopes that those might contribute to some of the things that help you get closer to your hopes and dreams. Folks, today my guest is Lauren Walsh. Lauren has over 20 years of experience in the world of helping to envision, define, and share the story of brands in sports and music. She's worked with the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball athletes, ranging from some of the top first round draft picks to Hall of Famers. She's negotiated deals and partnerships on behalf of some of the largest brands in the entire world. And she launched her own branding agency in 2015 and today serves as one of the top executives in sports and marketing. I loved hearing Warren talk about things like, hey, you can have it all, but you just can't have it all at the same time. Second, he, you have to have a ton of grit and determination to achieve the things that are most important to you. And one of the things that stuck with me the most is when we talked about how success in life is found in the strength and significance of your daily habits. This is a must listen, a must watch. Enjoy my conversation with Warren Walsh. Folks, I'm so excited to be here again for another incredible conversation. You know, I, th I think two of these ways that I'm going to describe Lauren are maybe Instagram, LinkedIn, professional bio accurate. But then I'm going to add this last one, which is my interpretation of her in observing her from afar. You know, we're sitting together today with one of the top executives in sports and music entertainment at Quality Control. I am so blessed to have Lauren here. Number two, complete mom boss, complete mom boss to two beautiful children. What a privilege and blessing. But number three, I want to add this because this is a, I, you know, I think it's accurate, but maybe a loose interpretation of the way I'm observing you on social media. And it's this, this high powered, high functioning, high performing woman who is on this like journey of just personal professional healing and development in sharing that story, which is a beautiful story with everybody in her life. And so how close are we? I, I think I, you just got hired to be my personal brand manager. Yeah. So I'm going to take you with me. <laughs> yes, you're spot on. I love the mom boss comment because recently my daughter has been calling me that. And second to that, I love the piece about healing and development because at the end of the day, 
titles are great. They do get us in rooms. They may get you on a podcast here and there. But the thing that's really, really important and one of the things that means so much to me is when I meet someone in person and they say, holy cow, you are the same person in real life as you are on the internet. That to me is the biggest compliment because that is what I strive to do. When I get up and I choose to share my life on social media, on LinkedIn, on podcasts, I really want people to feel like they can get to know who I really am, which is the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything that has transpired over the last decade or so as I've been on this journey to really get to this point in time. Yeah, I love that you expanded on that. Clearly a consistent track record of success. I think back to the way you initially hit my radar, which is really in the branding space. And I always think that somebody who chooses a profession like marketing, advertising, branding, public relations, it's got to be a true passion to want to tell a story, to want to share great stories. Can you take me back, take our listeners back a little bit to when you knew you wanted to be in the business of advocating for others and what was special about their story? Of course, I'll never forget the moment. So right after college, I got hired to be a mentor for the Purdue University football team, which is my my alma mater, where I was (laughs) captain of the cheer squad. I'll add that in. And I was sitting in study hall with my group of athletes that I was working with. And I looked at one of them and I said, what is your plan for after school? And he gave me this look and said, Lauren, you already know I'm going to the NFL. I said, yes, I know. Of course, you all are. You're all going to the NFL. But let's say you do. Okay, let's say you go to the NFL. Let's say you even defy the odds and you play 10 years in the NFL. You are going to retire, a.k.a. get kicked out. And then what are you going to do with your life? And he said, well, I don't know. I'll just, I'll be fine. I'll have made all this money. I said, yep, you're going to be in your mid thirties and you need to know what you're going to do. And he looked at me and said, no one has ever asked me that question before in my entire life. And I said, okay, now the light bulb goes off. And I realized that all of these individuals that I was at least working with, they had this goal and this dream, but no one ever pushed them to think about what happens off the field or what was going to happen after their career. And it was honestly at that point in time that I saw an opportunity and the passion ignited within me. And I truly made it my mission from that point forward to really help individuals, which ended up being athletes and entertainers, understand the power of who they are as a person, which is what your brand is, has an amazing ability to set you up for present and future success, whether that's on or off the field or on or off the stage. And that early insight and observation has led you to a tremendous amount of success serving and advocating and sharing the story of many people in sports and entertainment, specifically music. Can you share a little bit about what that career progression looked like? after that program at at Purdue University Lafayette? Yeah, so I did it for a couple years. West Lafayette wasn't necessarily my vibe after college, so I moved back to Chicago, worked in finance, and then actually as a recruiter for a couple of years before finally deciding I was going to walk away from my comfy corporate job with my 401k and my salary and the benefits and everything and start my own company. And At the time, all I knew was that I wanted to help athletes understand the power of their brand and help them make money off of it. Mm -hmm. That was really it. So when I first started, that's what I went into it with. I didn't know anyone. Of course, I had a couple friends from college. Some had gone on to play. Some were playing overseas. But they all had agents. They were set up. And so I worked for almost a year at just cold calling, cold calling, cold emailing, going after every single agent, financial advisor, manager that you could imagine. Finally, there was one agent that decided to give me a chance. And he literally said to me, Lauren, I'm going to set up the meeting. This guy is projected to go in the top 20 in this upcoming NBA draft, but that's it. I'm not going to recommend you. I'm not going to tell him anything else about you. You have to show up if it works great. Luckily, after about three hours of just having small talk with Sam Decker, he said, do you want to come to New York? I think you could help me. There's a couple things that are happening, you know, day to day. I've seen the schedule of what happens surrounding the draft. Maybe you could be helpful. I'm like, I'm there. 
paid my way, you know, literally maxed out credit cards to figure out how to go spend a week in New York leading up to the NBA draft and worked with Sam. He ended up getting drafted number 15 overall to the Houston Rockets. Afterwards, he's like, hey, maybe you could continue to help me, you know, like, let's figure out what that looks like. So that's how it started. The next couple clients were hard. The next probably two to three years were very, very hard of, again, just being in the trenches. It's an industry where you have to have clients to get clients, but nobody wants to be first. That's right. You know, so it's like impossible. It's like, wait a minute, (laughs) I have to have great athletes to get more but no no you're not going to give me a chance it was I couldn't figure it out it was so confusing so I just kept at it I showed up to the NFL combine every single year every single year literally would just walk up to agents like hey I heard you're so-and-so can I shake your hand do you have five minutes can I buy you a coffee most of them said no <laughs> one, of, one of the best stories honestly is that um, I'll no. never forget for three years I would email this agent three years straight Every single year, I'd say, hey, look, I'm going to be at the combine. Let's get coffee. He's like, absolutely not. I don't have time for you. Three years later, I got a call one day, and it happens to be Miles Garrett's dad. And he's like, hey, this is Lawrence Garrett. His agent gave me your cell phone number. I said, wait, the guy who told me no for three years straight gave you my cell phone number and told you to call me because you needed help with marketing. So, I mean, that's, I have stories for days, but that's just one of them where literally I think what's so important with just kind of telling all this is that I showed up to everything and I paid my way. I mean, I was literally waiting tables at a restaurant on the side just to make sure that I had enough money to pay my bills. I moved back in with my parents. Like I was sacrificing everything for the long-term gain that I knew. I mean, I was betting on myself. I knew that everything was going to work out. I didn't know how long it was going to take, but I knew it would. And so I did everything kept showing up, kept sending emails. Every time they said no, I would give them a couple months and go back to them. But I think that's the thing a lot of times in sports and entertainment where people maybe give up is it's like, no one wants to give me a chance. Well, of why do they owe you anything? You know, like no one owes us anything. You have to go out and work for it. You just made me think of so many Instagram reels. Yeah. And like good ones. I mean, I'm talking about like, Chris Willex, I'm talking about Alex Hermosi, Ed Milet. Like you just made me think of so many powerful comments mm-hmm. that have so much value in them. One of them, though, that's standing out in my mind is you do not fail unless you quit. 100%. The only path to failure is quitting. Yeah. What is it maybe about your childhood, your parents, or other people in your life that influence you to be such a gritty, you know, just off the charts, tough, resilient, bounce back ability, like intensity woman? Gymnastics. Shout out to my mom (laughs) who put me in gymnastics at a young age. So here's the thing. We had a swing set in the backyard. Unlike a normal child who may go down the slide or go sit on the swing, I was climbing across the swing set as if it was just this big jungle gym. It was, yeah, that was it. So my mom was like, I think we need to channel this energy somewhere. So the age of three, she put me in gymnastics and fast track by the age of five, I'm competing by the age of seven. I'm literally on track to figure out how I'm going to work towards the Olympics. My coaches had always been former Olympians. And so that was it from a, I mean, imagine being a seven year old child practicing six days a week, three hours a day, taking private lessons on Sundays if we didn't have a meet and doing that for years. So that honestly is where a lot of my work ethic came in to Mm -hmm. be because I also saw with something like that, I saw the result of hard work. I practiced every single day. Mind you, while my friends are out, they're having fun, they're playing, they're doing all the different activities. And every day I know what I have to do. I have to go spend three hours at the gym as a child. But what that did was then I'd show up and go to a meet and I'm getting first place and I'm winning all around. And it starts to help you understand 
wait, if you work really, really hard and you stay dedicated in other areas, the other thing was learning at a young age, look, there's other areas of mindset of what you eat, of the people that you surround yourself with. I mean, my coaches ingrained in me even at a young age of like, look, Lauren, you want to be this Olympic gymnast? You have to watch who you're around. You have to watch what you're consuming. Not, it's not just the output of practice. Mm-hmm. And I took that in and I took it to heart. It wasn't until I did end up quitting because it just got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I don't think, I don't, I don't think the Olympics are for me. I think I got to channel this somewhere else. But honestly, going back to doing that at a young age, it stuck with me. You seem like an exceptionally strong communicator. I started speaking at a young age. I mean, the same thing. There are videos of me. I got, I, how old was I? Probably like, I don't know, maybe four or five. And I got a this whole set of like a, um, big microphone and like a, and I'd be standing in front of the fireplace like singing and dancing and performing and then when I got into grade school I was president of my eighth grade class you won't even believe that most people don't know this I sang my speech first of all I can I can speak I can communicate I'm not a singer but I sang my speech because I thought it would give me an edge on the other candidates and it did but what comes with being class president in eighth grade mind you you're still a child you have to speak at every single school function so from that age on that's simply how it started and then I really just fell in love with words the ability to communicate helping other people understand that talking things out sharing what you're going through has the ability to then impact other people where do you think this unflinching like passion and commitment and vision to be in sports, music, and entertainment. Where do you think that that was born from? Was it born from gymnastics or was it something, some moment or someone else that created that for you? I think it was when I was mentoring the Purdue football players. I really do because the thing was at that point in time, it was student athletes that I was working with. Yeah. So it's not to say that there's other people outside of that that don't need it. I think everyone you know, needs the ability to understand their brand. I mean, especially this day and age that we live in. However, that was what really ignited it for me. And sports has always played such a large role in my life from gymnastics to transitioning to cheerleading. That getting me captain of the cheer squad at Purdue, that leading to opportunities. That didn't just give me opportunities in the sports space. That opened my eyes to travel. We traveled to all the NCAA tournaments and the bowl games. That was the first time I ever came to Detroit was when Mm -hmm. we played in the Motor City Bowl. So it also had a very big impact on my life because it opened up my eyes to the rest of the world, to culture, and to everything that life really has to offer. I've heard you give the advice, you can definitely have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. Can you share a little bit with our listeners why you've shared that many times? Like what specifically does that mean to you and what's the lesson for our listeners? Yeah, that's one of my favorite, probably my my most important motto that I have. It was birthed out of the question that I have been getting ever since I had kids, which is, how do you do it all? That's yeah. what I, that's like the number one burning question yeah. people want to ask you. Every panel I speak on, it's like, how do you do it all? You're an executive and you have kids at home. And I would always tell them, look, you can have anything. You can literally be and do anything. You can have everything you want in life. You just can't have it all at the same time. And what that means is, and the way to take that and apply it to your life is that you have to be where your feet are. You have to Hmm. learn how to be present and intentional. And the reason I learned this and I'm so passionate about sharing it with other people is because I think as working moms, we have the pressure to have it all together. Mm -hmm. Meaning we are showing up to the soccer games and we have the perfect snacks and we Mm -hmm. look put together and then we're also crushing it at work. Mm -hmm. And I used to find myself splitting time where... My kids are sitting there. I'm trying to sit with them on the floor playing a game. But simultaneously, I have an AirPod in and I'm listening to, you know, a Zoom meeting that I have, you know, something with work. And they would realize it and they could see she's not here with us. She's not present. And so I started to look at that and say, okay, how can I have all these different things? And it was start to set up your life in a way where you are present wherever you're at. That's why Childcare is very important. Being able to have great childcare where I can drop my kids off Mm -hmm. and allow them, like I'm not one of those people who is checking my kids app, you know, from daycare all day because 
I trust the caretakers. Yeah. Take care of them. They will call me if there's a problem. I need to then be able during the day between nine and five to go all in on my work. But mm -hmm. then when I'm done with work, now it's time to be present for my kids. Mm -hmm. So that's where it came from is because I think we need to allow working moms to take the pressure off a little bit and mm -hmm. understand you don't have to have it all together all the time. You have to figure out how to be very present, be where your feet are at that very given time, and just go 110% at that given moment with whoever is around you. It sounds as if, if I'm, if I'm listening well, it sounds as if you've gotten very comfortable with managing expectations and maybe even establishing some basic boundaries so that people know exactly what they're gonna get from you at any given point in time. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, boundaries are probably one of the most important things that have allowed me to reach a certain level of success, a certain level of personal development. Yeah, a great amount of success. I mean, I saw your client list. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. But you know what it came down to? I had to get over the fact that you can't be a people pleaser and climb the ladder. You can't. You have to yes. get over that. I used to do that. And when I was people pleasing, it had left me in a position where I was even more insecure. I was always stressed out. I was dropping the ball because I'm trying to be over here and focus on this person. And then I realized, you know what? There's some power in saying no to things. And mm -hmm. so I remember hearing, I, I don't remember who it was, but I remember hearing someone say on a podcast of when you say yes to something, you have to ask yourself, what am I saying no to? Mm -hmm. If I say yes to going and doing something, you know, on a Saturday, well, I'm saying no to my kids. If I say yes to taking on something at my kid's school, I may be saying no to a meeting. So I started to really internalize that and started really asking myself that question every single time. Okay, if I say yes to this invitation, what am I saying no to? And that allowed me to put up some really, really strong boundaries. And it also came with understanding and really accepting who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. When I first started the interview process, when QC came after me and they said, you know, please, can we meet and set up all these different interviews? And I was very direct. I said, look, guys, I want to make sure you know who I am. I want to make sure you know that I am this person. I'm very focused on my kids. I'm very vulnerable. I share different things on social media, whether it is, you know, God or spirituality or personal development or depression or meditation. And I laid that out and they looked at me and they said, we've already done our research. That's mm -hmm. why we're sitting here right now mm -hmm. because we've done that. We know that's who you are. And I mm -hmm. said, great. I just want to make sure before we get into this, you know what you're getting into so we don't have to revisit that. Mm -hmm. And I think also empowering myself to accept that this is who I am. I am going to be very particular with my time. I'm going to be very particular even with my energy. Even the people that I share my time and space with is strategic. I say all the time, I call it strategic parenting and strategic life. The way that I handle business in the boardroom, mm -hmm. the way that I put together strategic plans and brand strategies, I apply that to my life. I take it over into my life and that is how I run things. That's how I do things in my home with my kids. And that's how I even do things with my friends. And I am not afraid to disappoint people. I had to do it recently. I was like, you know what? I just need space. I've been traveling. I felt myself like feeling obligated to go to certain things I'd been invited to. I texted them. I said, look, here's where I'm at in my life right now. I know you're going to understand. I just want you to know. And the response, because they're real friends, was, oh, I get it. Here's what I'm going through right now. Let's get together for coffee because that's easier than you coming to my event. And let's talk about what we're going through. She's like a really strong communicator. <laughs> I'm like, you guys hey, want to hire me? Hey, do you, um, <laughs> you want to co-host? Do you want to come in and run my life? <laughs> Chrissy would love you as a teammate. Well, thank you that your strategy put you here today. Yeah. Because I hear you. You know, I totally feel what you're saying and I'm picking it up. I've also heard people talk about how much like meaningful self-power there is in being peaceful about saying no. Mm hmm when do you think that you really realized, yes, I want all of that, but I've got to manage my own expectations on the healthy way to get all of that. Mm -hmm. And part of that is I've got to start saying no to things. Mm -hmm. When do you think that that became a real part of who you are? Yeah, so it was two and a half years ago. I can time it perfectly because my son just turned three a couple weeks ago. Two and a half years ago, I was six months postpartum with my second child. And I remember 
It was the night before my birthday. My birthday was the next day. I sat down at my computer. When's your birthday? I, January 10th. Okay. So January 9th, I'm sitting there. It's late. My kids are finally sleeping. And I open up my computer and I open up the Google search and I'm like shaking and I'm crying and I type postpartum depression into the search bar. And that was the first time I knew, but that was the first time in those six months that I was able to admit to myself what was really going on. And I typed it in, I started to do research. Subsequently after that, you know, talked to my family, I talked to my doctor. I attempted to use medicine. I took one antidepressant one day. It made me feel the worst that I had felt in six months. And I said, you know what? This is obviously not the route for me. I told my doctor, I will try one. But if I don't feel great, I think it's a sign. And so I made a commitment to myself at that point in time. I was going to go on a journey. I didn't know how long it was going to take. I didn't know what was going to come out of it. But I committed to whatever needed to happen to make me the number one priority. Because mm. nothing else was going to be around. My career, my kids, all none of these things were going to be happening right. if I wasn't whole. Right. And in, then in that very moment, I had to commit to that process and that required saying no to a lot of things. Yeah. And I could only say yes to what was going to serve me in that healing journey. I've since gone on, I call it my secret sabbatical because if you do research, you know, a sabbatical is when you truly yeah. disconnect from life, from the day to day, you yeah. step back. That's what I did. But it was a secret because I didn't tell anybody. I was able to maintain a level of work that I still got enough work done for my clients, but I got really good at only working a couple hours a day and still getting the right amount of things done. And I spent the rest of the time healing and people didn't know. And I continued on that journey for a very long time. Sure. Technically, I think for me, I'm still on it. I think we're forever still on it. But yeah. that was it. When I decided that that was that point in time, and also it was, I mean, it was life or death. I mean, I had suicidal thoughts. I'm so mentally strong. I'm sure you could, you picked up on that. Mm -hmm. I was never afraid that I was actually going to harm myself. But the voices inside my head were very scary, especially when I'd have my kids in the backseat of my car. I'm driving them to school and the voices are saying, drive off the side of the road. It was like, no, this cannot happen anymore. And that was when no became not just a powerful word in my life, but mm -hmm. I think also part of that kind of life or death situation that I had to commit to, to get me to this point where we are sitting here right now. Yeah. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That's really meaningful. And it's yeah. meaningful because I think probably many people go through moments like that. Yeah. You know, I'm very happily married to the love of my life, 19 and a half years. And uh, we have children. Mm -hmm. And I know that. It wasn't easy to leave an incredible career in advertising to just say, hey, I'm going to be the greatest mom on the planet that I can be. So I can really appreciate a lot of things that you just shared. Yeah. Who do you think, when you think back to that moment, and I, I, I heard you say, like, it's kind of like a never-ending journey. Mm -hmm. So my wife, Samantha, often says, like, hey, we're going to die broken. Yeah. We're going to die, yes, like, fighting are. to improve. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Who do you think is the person that just without knowing or knowing, but just like most organically just always showed up for you? Like this person was always a blessing when they showed up. If I think back to that, this is probably not the answer you would expect, but it was myself. I showed up for myself and awesome. then it was God who showed up for me yeah. every single day. There was even a period where I remember I was so mad because I'm like, God, I this I need you really bad right now. But I felt like the volume on his voice had turned down a little bit. And mm -hmm. now looking back, I know why, because I needed to go on the journey. I needed it to be hard. I needed to do the work. And the reason I say that is because I was at a point where, unfortunately, but also fortunately, the people closest to me didn't understand what I was going through. Hmm. And I did turn to a lot of people very, very close to me, and I cried out for help, and I sent them articles, and I tried to send podcasts and explain what I was going through, because I got to a point where 
what I was saying wasn't working. So I said, well, maybe if I give someone else's point of view, they'll understand. Mm -hmm. And they just could not grasp exactly what it was. And that's when I said, you know what? Maybe there is no one showing up, you know, riding in on a horse Mm -hmm. to save me. Maybe Mm -hmm. I have to save myself. Mm -hmm. And in return, saving myself I knew would be able to save other people. So Mm -hmm. it was myself, but I was backed by God. You know, I knew I had all this work that I'd done on myself, you know, so I was never technically alone, but Mm -hmm. it really was showing up for myself and not feeling bad for myself either. Not saying, oh, how could, you know, these people not show up for me and how could I have to go through this? Because the version of myself that you are sitting across from here today is only here because of how hard that journey was. It, it sounds as if from like the, what you've shared so far that there's always been an element of faith in your life that has kind of been like the conveyor belt, if you will, to keep you moving forward. Was that something that you're comfortable like just touching on? And is that something from the early part of your childhood or? Yeah, of course. So I was born and raised in the Catholic Church and <laughs> growing up, very interesting enough, you know, going to Catholic school. You learn all the religious pieces. I made all the sacraments. I can still repeat all the prayers, but I didn't understand what it meant to have a relationship with God. And so God was always in my life. We always went to church on Sunday, but it was actually after college when I went through this period of who am I? Like asking, you know, the deep questions of who am I? What matters? Like, God, what are you doing with me in my life? Like, are you even there? You know, what is happening? And then I went on this journey of self-discovery, getting back into relationship with God. And that was, I might, I must have been in my mid-20s when I started to understand what it meant to sit down and read the Bible and really understand what God was trying to tell me. And then I started reading certain books. The book Whisper by Mark Batterson oh. changed my life because yeah, learning how to understand the voice of God. So what I'll say is, Faith has always been a part of it, but over the last 10 years, I really went on this journey to get to know who God was, my relationship with God, and really foster that, and then let that lead in every other area of my life. And I'm very open about it. You know, a lot of times Mm -hmm. people are like, you work in sports and entertainment, you can't talk about your faith. And I'm like, watch me, you know? And people always say, you know, how do you work in this industry? And there's so much darkness. And I said, that's why I work in it. I Trust me, I ask God all the time. I literally all the time and I'm like, God, are you sure this is where I'm supposed to be? Like, are, is this what I'm supposed to do? And it's always like, yes, because those places need the light. That's what needs to happen. You have to be able and willing to be bold in your faith. That's the only way. It's not just about showing up for church. It's about being able to sit in rooms. I'll say certain things or act a certain way. And I know that people know it goes way beyond wearing a cross around my neck. Mm -hmm. I truly take it to heart to show up in meetings and have ethics and values and treat people a certain way Mm -hmm. and lead with character. And so that is something that has been very prevalent. And until God tells me that I'm no longer supposed to be here and in this industry, I'm going to keep living that out every day i hear people consistently state things like oh it's the industry Mm -hmm. oh you know sports entertainment music movies Mm -hmm. media i feel as if it's just the presence of money Mm -hmm. that confuses us us about where like our boundaries are around values ethics morals because at the end of the day, you know, and I think, you you know, we talked about this a little bit. We have some mutual friends mm-hmm. like Izzy Adonage from mm-hmm. Chicago. Shout out to Izzy and all the great work that he's done in his life. Just as such a talented human. But money creates the power of choice and access mm-hmm. to so many things mm-hmm. that you can't have access to without money. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I don't think it's the industries. I think it's the access to capital. It's the access to money. It's the access to the, this belief system that you can buy your way in and out of mistakes. Mm-hmm. And sadly, I think our, our society has like a real issue with that in general. Mm-hmm. You know, we hear these things like, hey, money talks, everything else walks. Well, we're perpetuating that. Mm-hmm. 
right? Yeah. Thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, I would say I also think it's a lack of self-awareness. I think it is empowering. Say more about that. Yeah, I think a lot of people who work in the quote unquote industry have never taken the time to understand who they are. And then they get yeah. put in positions of power or they're streaming certain numbers or they're making certain dollars and they never took the time to figure out, okay, what does all this mean? Who am I? What am I doing? What is my mission? That's why you'll often see people. Why do you think so many child stars blew up and then all of a sudden like their life is crumbling because mm -hmm. no one ever took the time to ask them the deep questions questions and I think also we we focus on the things that sometimes don't as much matter look that's great go ahead go out and make your money money can be used for a lot of really really good things wonderful you can things. wonderful things I mean yeah. money is great you know you can take money and you can impact so many people but the reality is when you just give money to people who haven't done the work, they don't know what to do with it it's why oftentimes yeah. I get really upset when people look at athletes and entertainers and they'll say well, they have all this money. How could they not understand how to manage it? Or how can they not understand how to live their life? It's like, tell me at what point in time someone sat them down and said, hey, let's outline your values. Mm -hmm. What are your goals in life? Yeah. Outside of topping the charts or winning a Super Bowl, what are your actual goals? What is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Those questions are usually left off the table. You sit down, you have a strategy meeting, they figure out how to get you straight to the top and make the most amount of money. They're not asking a lot of those questions. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think people fall by the wayside. They make mistakes. It's why you see so many people with money who have things that are happening. They're, we all have demons. Like, you, like your wife said, we're all broken. Unless you take the time to do the work, now you're just adding fuel to the fire when you go and put more dollar signs in there. What does it look like to be your client today? Let's pretend that I'm not a slightly overweight 45 year old Mexican male and somehow I'm, I'm this incredible prospect for the NFL. Mm -hmm. What is it that would be on Manuela Mesqua's mind? What are the things that I need that would make me an incredible, incredible client for you? Exact questions that I just mentioned. I wanna yeah. make sure that you have real goals in life like I want to make sure that you also understand that there was something put on your life that you are in this position okay because when you make it to being a professional athlete or a top tier music artist do you understand the odds that you have defied at that point like have you taken the time to step back and say wait a minute clearly God knew what he was doing with me to get me to this point in time because look around how many of your teammates from Pee Wee football growing up or even high school or even college Say less. are doing nothing? Yeah. So let's take a second and step back and I'll ask him those questions. Do you understand that you've been anointed with a certain gift? Yeah. And the people that I have right now, they will, they are able to say yes. And then I say, okay, well, what do you think you're supposed to do with that? Because guess what? It's going to be more than making plays. Now, listen, we always say... When you are a professional athlete, the number one thing is what you do, of course, on the field or the court, because that relates over to what my ability to do your job. If you're not playing, I'm sorry, but the brands are not knocking down the door <laughs> to come talk to me. But at yeah. the same time, do you understand that? And then what do you want to do with it? OK, and it needs to go beyond. Well, I just I want to take care of my mom or my high school friend. Cool. We can do all those things. But what else is it? So I sit down. I mean, I have an entire list of questions. So if we sign a new client and this goes the same because our agents will sign clients and then bring them and introduce them to me. And I go through this whole thing. I'm like, look, what's your why? Some of these kids look at me like, who is this chick? Like, what is? what do you mean, what is my life? But that is a really powerful purpose, yeah. being the one in the family yes. that creates generational impact and influence. And breaks generational trauma. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I mean, I just, I, I had a, a financial planning meeting with a young man who's playing for the Detroit Lions right now, literally two days ago. And the conversation was centered around Manny, I'm the one. Mm -hmm. I carry so much pressure and stress mm -hmm. because I'm the one in my family. I'm the one to the grandparents. I'm the one to the parents and the uncles. I'm the one to my siblings. I'm the one to my nieces and nephews. I'm the one. Mm -hmm. Like that's really heavy. Yeah. And it's not just in sports, right? It's mm -hmm. in business. It's in music. It's yeah. in fashion. It's in, it's in anything in life that in a lot of families, 
it does at some point, Ed Milet talks about this a lot, but at some point, somebody has to be the one, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How often, though, is that the theme in a lot of these young men and women that you are the advocate of in mm -hmm. sports and music? How often is that the theme for them, their purpose? I actually have a good amount right now, and it's really based on how they were raised and, yeah. and regardless of where they came from. I mean, one of our clients that we have right now who plays in the NFL, I mean, he came from nothing. But from a very young age, his mom was working multiple jobs and was like, look, I'm going to do this for you. Yeah. And she was just able – she's in her late 30s. I mean, she was able to just – retire you know and and buy her house and all these different things but he saw that so it's it's a culmination of different things i actually do see it a good amount because a lot of the individuals even if they came from a really bad upbringing or they didn't have anything growing up mm -hmm. a lot of times there were people though that they saw and look up to mm -hmm. that's why the whole thing though of being the one i think you also have to ask the question of who is putting that pressure on you? Are you putting it on yourself or are you letting the people around you yeah, put it on you? Well said. Yeah, because it's if people around you are putting that pressure on you, it is not your job to take care of every single person. Now, can you set people up a certain way? Of course you can. Can mm -hmm. you do it from your heart and can you do it the right way? Of course. Mm -hmm. However, the goal is not to give people handouts. The goal is to continue to break those generational traumas and curses yes. and set people up for success because that is how you get generational wealth. I do research all the time about putting my children on payroll under an LLC that I have and starting them at a 401k at the yeah. age of five and three because that is going to create generational wealth. So again, to me, as you get into these realms and you have the money and you have the ability to sit in rooms and talk to people like you and I, it's also very important that you leverage the resources the right way and you figure out how to take what you do have and leave a real lasting impact. I, I love what you just, the comment that you made and the reference you made to how you're already, <laughs> your children are so young, God bless you. <laughs> uh, but you're already thinking about creating mm -hmm. these like little sports yeah. media moguls, yeah, right? Yeah, listen, there's way know. more than 529 <laughs> plans out there, okay? You you can speak more to that, but listen, there's way more. Like you can really set I these can, kids up for success. I can just imagine your two little babies walking in little suits with briefcases and sunglasses and an Oh, earpiece. I brought, you should see, I have great, you go on my Instagram. I brought my daughter to one of my speaking engagements and she put on her freshest Nikes in this leather their jacket uh, and she's walking in to the Michigan State football meeting room the whole team is there and she's sitting in the back and she's like this and I'm speaking down at the front and I'm like just watching and it's funny because recently we were talking about listening to something she goes well, it's not, that, that's like what you do. Like you go and you speak to people and you yeah. have a message. And I was like, that's right, baby. I have a message. You're going to have a message. But I mean, it's, that's where it starts. What is one of those messages that you would share right now? Maybe, maybe with young parents, but maybe not even the young parent, maybe the student athlete who's thinking about, man, I, I, I love her story. I can see myself walking in those shoes someday. What's the message or the lessons learned that you'd say, hey, these are a couple of things to keep in mind and just keep these in the back pocket for when you need them? Yeah, I think the number one thing is that you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. You're going to fail and it's going to be really hard. OK, if you want to be great at anything, you have to stand up and accept the mission that is coming for you, which is that you're going to have to walk through the fire because like they say, if it was easy, everyone would do it. So number one, you have to understand you are going to fail. How can you fail faster? How can you look at people very similar? And it may be looking at how other people fail. That's where listening to my story, listening to other people's stories who've made it, ask them the questions of how they went through something hard and how they got out of it. That's my biggest thing is that you have to figure out the tangible items. Mm -hmm. It's great to be motivated. It's great to go listen to motivational talks. But if you have the opportunity <laughs> to sit down with someone who's gone through something, yeah. ask them, what were the things that you did every single day? There is a reason why on my Instagram almost every day you will catch me posting that I'm drinking my warm water with lemon in the morning. It's not just to let people know I'm oh awake and I'm drinking water. It is because I want people to understand the fundamentals of success are the habits that you create, 
day after day in the most mundane moments of your life, not the flashy, really cool things that you do, that's what you have to understand. And what are you willing to do? What are the habits you're willing to implement? Even as simple as I'm driving here. It's a 20 minute drive. I have on a podcast while I'm driving here because I'm like, I have 20 minutes in the car. This is the only time I'm going to get to do it. And I use my time very strategically. So again, what are you going to change or do different? And you have to really work on getting to know yourself, fall in love with who you really are, flaws and all, fall in love with who you are, and then let that person show up and to heck with anyone who doesn't like that person as much as you do. So love a lot that you just said. I love a lot that you just said. I want to unpack two of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I heard you use the word willing. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with the word willing. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I recently listened to Coach Tomlin Mm -hmm. from the Steelers talk Mm -hmm. about the difference and what he measures as the difference between talented people is the talented people who are willing Mm -hmm. to do more Mm -hmm. because it's not about how gifted or talented you are Mm -hmm. it's it's really comes down to how much you're willing to do Mm -hmm. i love that who do you think when you reflect back on your very young life Mm -hmm. on your very young life Mm -hmm. who do you think has been probably the best example of that someone who's just always willing Mm -hmm to do more and show up in tough moments my dad my dad worked multiple jobs growing up and i remember in chicago in chicago you know my dad was a chicago fireman but he had two sometimes three side jobs going on the side because as a chicago fireman you work 24 hours on and then 48 hours off and so he would leave the firehouse at 7 a.m and go to his other job, sometimes then leave there and go to another side job. You know, someone in the neighborhood is building something or needs help with something, and he's going there and getting paid to do that. And I remember there were so many times where he'd come home and he would just kind of like melt into the couch, you know, because this man is out there saving people from burning buildings, building garages, you know, installing heating and air and all these things. (laughs) And I remember looking at him and being like, Wow. But then I looked around and realized, you know, okay, I'm able to live this life and go to a Big Ten university and all these things. But watching him navigate through that, because again, he didn't have to. I didn't have to go to private school. No, he didn't. We didn't have to have certain cars. Like, he didn't have to do any of that. He could have just had, just being a Chicago fireman is a great job, you know, and there's great benefits. Yes. And you do so much in those 24 hours. You probably need 48 hours off. But he was able and willing to do that for himself and for his family which then trickled down and he also he took it to heart that he had three daughters like he knew also like okay if i'm gonna be a girl dad i have to instill these things in these three these three little humans and i need to make sure i'm giving them the right stuff so looking back him doing that day after day like when he finally retired i was like can you go like live your life like please you know now he gets to hang out with all the grandkids but it was really that watching him get up and choose to do that even though most of the time i could see it on his face He was tired, very tired, but he knew that that was part of the job that he felt that he was really committed to. Are we allowed to say his name? Yeah, Mike Walsh. Shout out to Mike Walsh. Yeah, if you know him, you love him. He's also the biggest Purdue football fan you could ever imagine. Well, I'm not going to hold that against Mr. (laughs) Walsh, but I will. I will say, like I've always, and Jill and Holly would tell you. My parents are both from Mexico, and Mm -hmm. in our entire life, my brothers Mm -hmm. and I have the privilege to live our version of the American dream because of the sacrifices of military men and women and first line responders. Yeah. And we don't, you know, we don't take that for granted. And so mm-hmm. when I think of like people who have given their life for these very, very stressful mm-hmm. and dangerous professions that yeah. provide for our quality of lives, mm-hmm. like 
it's like, hey, you can't miss that moment to say thank you. So yeah. thanks to your dad. Thanks yeah. to Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and Mr. Walsh, I went to DePaul, which was an hour south of Purdue Lafayette. I so I, so <laughs> I didn't dislike the Purdue <laughs> Boilermakers, but, you know, I don't know why. You know, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a, 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 an immigrant Catholic, yeah. so I was a Notre Dame fan in my childhood. Oh, I, listen, you know? I grew up in the most Irish Catholic community you could imagine in Chicago. Yeah, Those people say, were the biggest me. Notre Dame fans you could ever met. I had a Notre Dame starter jacket growing up. I have to admit that, but it ended up, you know, going to the Big Ten. Which I'm going to yeah. tell you, like, yeah, I wasn't surprised when you told me where you actually grew yeah. up. I was like, oh, there's no way that's like not yeah. a hardcore Catholic oh, yeah. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The second thing, though, and I wanted to unpack this because I know we're running out of time, but I heard you say something and these aren't your exact words, but this is my interpretation of what you said. Success lives in the strength and significance of your daily habits. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Look, we are only as good as what we do in the small moments. It is not about the big life-changing things that you may do. It's not about the premieres that I go to or the album release parties or the Super Bowls that I go and attend. It is about the time I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do, what I do throughout the day, when I get off track, how I pull myself back, my nighttime routine, choosing to also carry that out in days that I don't want to. There's, mm -hmm. I travel a certain, I'm strategic mm -hmm. about the time of day that I travel mm -hmm. because I need to make sure that I'm optimizing my health and everything that comes along with it. So I have seen the direct correlation of what comes from that, but I think that's where most people aren't willing to do the work. I really think so. Most people see and they're like, well, but I showed up to that event and I stayed until it was oh over and I spoke to all the people who were there. Yeah, that's cool. But yeah. then when you went home and you went to bed, what did you, what's the first thing you did the next morning? When was the last time you meditated? When was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you, you journaled or you know ate something healthy? I don't know, drank a little extra water. Those are the things that I can guarantee. Those are the things that I preach to my team. We start every team meeting with a gratitude session. Before we go around the room and we talk about what's what we're working on, yeah. I say, okay, everyone tell me, what are you grateful for right now? And sometimes I'll, I'll jump in. I'll like come in hot to the meeting and they'll be like, Lauren, uh, we forgot to do gratitude. Like, yes, we did. Let's, let's go back. You know, The tiniest of things are what will change your life. I've heard so many times people say, hey, it takes what it takes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I listened to a podcast recently and, and the young lady is a young lady and, and she was talking about the fact that you can't expect to win consistently if you're not doing what it takes to consistently win. Mm -hmm. I love that. And she was like, it's so simple. And yet we lie to ourselves mm -hmm. and say we can take a day off and then mm -hmm. a week off. And sadly, mm -hmm. a day becomes a week, a week mm -hmm. becomes a month, a month becomes a year. And a year can become a life of regret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been really special to have you here. And I know you just came off of Creator Con at mm -hmm. Detroit. Mm -hmm. My girl Lauren was a keynote down there last night. Good for you. Thank I know you. it was a huge success. So many people turned out for that. No surprise on that. I, I feel as if the story of your life has been not just one about winning, but one about being consistent and mm -hmm. being persistent and being just an absolute pro. Mm -hmm. My friend Benny Fowler always says like, hey man, just be a pro. Mm -hmm. Be a pro at everything in your life. And there's no doubt that your life's a reflection of that. We have a lot of young men and women that listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. What would you say is that last piece of advice you would leave them with to say, Here's a couple of ways I've consistently showed up as a pro, mm -hmm. and I think these could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Bet on yourself. There's going to be a lot of times in your journey where you wake up and you're not motivated. It feels very dark. Everything around you is falling apart. Mm -hmm. Take a minute every single time in that. Literally just close your eyes if you need to. Like put your hand on your heart. Remind yourself your mm. heart is beating. You are here. Yeah. You woke up. It really is a gift to wake up. And if you are there and you're standing there and you're having these thoughts, Bet on yourself and remind yourself that no matter how dark, how hard it feels, if you can just continue to just take just one step every single day, if you can just take one step in the right direction and continue to bet on yourself, regardless of what is happening around you, step after step, day after day, year after year, one day you will wake up and you will look around and you will say, holy cow, I did this mm -hmm. and I've achieved this level of life that I only thought I could dream of. 
And that will make you even more excited, even more motivated to then continue and go after and climb that next mountain. You heard it. The badass Lauren Walsh. <laughs> Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I loved it. It was so good to have you here. Yeah, thanks. And I meant it. Total mom boss. I see it even more now. Literally, like, you got to add, like, spiritual and, like, healing guru somewhere in the tagline. <laughs> but, I mean, look, folks, I mean, we had we had one of the very, very brightest superstars, executives in the sports and entertainment space. It was really a privilege to have you here in Michigan with us today. And I'm so glad that you made time. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Yeah. Thank you again so much for listening. And thanks to our guest, Lauren Walsh. Connect with Lauren on Instagram at Lauren E. Walsh, W-A-L-S-H. If you like what you heard today, please be sure to follow, rate, and review at the podium on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your show. Remember, you can also follow the show on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. It's at podium underscore podcast. Post about the show on social media and tag us. We'll repost to share our gratitude. Your support means the world to us. And if you enjoy our content, we'd love for you to hit that subscribe button to stay updated on everything that's going on with our growing podcast family. We'd also love for you to share this. Friend to friend is still the greatest way that we can grow our audience and following. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time.